Welcome back to another episode of Fit Mummy Nation TV. I hope to share with you the amazing stories of fit mummies in Singapore who embrace the lifestyle of leading healthy and active motherhoods. Now, these amazing women have been through the ups and downs of motherhood and they have seen their fair share of navigating challenges along with achieving their health goals. There is so much to share, so much to learn and so much to be inspired by each of their stories. Today, I have the privilege of inviting Estelle Lowe on the show. Now, Estelle is mom to two lovely kids who are under seven years old. Um, I first got to know Estelle back in the day when she was working for Shape Magazine and she came for my book launch in 2015. She is now working as a digital editor with uh, Her World Singapore. We spent some time understanding her work and <laughs> appreciating what it was like working in a three-man team for The Shape magazine. I mean, back when I first got to know her, I was completely unaware that the team was actually this small. So it was really interesting to hear how working at Shape helped to um, change her perspective of you know, what fitness um, truly is and how that has helped her keep herself active all this time. In fact, she has learned over the years that fitness and motherhood are highly correlated. Okay, I will not reveal too much about her now, so let's get right into the chat with Estelle to find out how she keeps herself mentally and physically in shape after two kids. Hello, hello. Thank you, Estelle, for coming on for this chat this morning and spending time with us. Estelle has a very interesting um, background. Um, you will be interested to know what she does. I will not take the stage from her. I'll let her introduce herself. Um, just share with everybody what you do and uh, a little bit about your kids and anything interesting you want mommies here to know about you before we um, get into the real deep stuff. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Estelle. Thanks so much, Corinne, for inviting me to be part of this. I'm really very happy to support you, you know, in your in your whole approach in advocating for more fit mummies because I think this is super important in times like this. Um, so just a bit of background about what I do. Professionally, I'm a digital editor. I am journalism trained, so I have been in the publishing industry for the last eight years. Uh, so I spent my previous I think seven years at Shape Magazine, um, being a writer and then being an editor, you know, helming the Shape events like Shape Run, you would have heard about it. And also meeting a lot of fitness personalities and people in the fitness and health industry in general. And I guess that's how I got to know you, Kareem. Yes. Uh, I remember <laughs> att attending the launch of your book, right? 18 again. And yes. I think at that time, I was really very impressed by you, you know, thinking, wow, she's like a mom of two and entrepreneur writing a book as well. Uh, I was quite impressed by your energy and also your dedication to this course. And so I, over the years, I think you have been someone that I actually do look up to, you know, like somebody who manages uh, her time well and manages to still keep fit, keep healthy and be a good role model for her kids. <laughs> <laughs> I try my best. I try my best. <laughs> yeah. We are all balancing all these things on our plates. <laughs> yeah. So I guess fit, uh, fitness and health are something very close to my heart, which is why I was at Shape for, for this amount of time. Um, so currently I'm with Herbal Singapore as digital editor, where I handle all sorts of content, ranging mm -hmm. from fashion and beauty to lifestyle, entertainment, um, career topics as well. So I think a big part of my work involves uh, using my laptop and my phone because it's digital, right? Yes. So I'm basically in charge of making sure that the content goes up on the website, herworld.com. Um, things run smoothly on a day-to-day -day basis. Our campaigns get rolled out and also um, planning for content to kind of engage our audience and always um, also have to be abreast of like the latest news and trends in Singapore. So it's mm. really like, um, a job that really keeps me on my feet and I'm it is I, I right. say, yeah it makes me more and more addicted to checking my social feeds all the time because I just need to know what's going on you just need to keep abreast of what's going on yeah what's and then also like happening. adapt our content um, accordingly to, to kind of stay relevant and stay up to date yes. so I guess that to me is like the most challenging part of my work because it really forces me to be online I feel this obligation to be online even when I'm not at work 
So like, I spend my night time like, scrolling through my, my social feeds and sometimes even checking the website to make sure things are fine. You know, like, like say my posts on Facebook are going up as planned, that, that kind of thing. So you can't really, yes. really switch off. Yeah. yeah, so I guess I, I do try to spend time with my kids um, during my non-working hours. Uh, I have two kids. So uh, one is six this year. Her name is Gabrielle and the other is four, not four, three this year. Three. <laughs> Going to turn four, is it? That's why. No, he's going to turn three, actually. <laughs> well, I wish that age, age gaps were closer, but they are not. Yeah, three years apart. You're trying to make him grow up faster. I wish, yeah, because he's like really immature. His mm-hmm. name is Ethan, and he has just started um, pre end this year, so he's in preschool. And my daughter will be heading to primary one next year. Yeah, so honestly, I think like this whole journey of motherhood has been really up and down for me and I think it's, it's just a lifelong learning journey I think everyone's just learning things along the way trying to adapt and trying to be a better version of ourselves yeah that's right um I mean have you so from um moving from shape as a I mean you started off as a writer right you said and then before becoming an editor and then at her world you're doing um something different so over this years I think it's a uh, I think these are big changes as well and your role has evolved so what what's the um what would you say is the biggest difference in terms of you know being a writer and then uh, being an editor versus now being a digital editor okay so um, previously when I started out as a writer I think the main things I had to be concerned about was really just writing stories like coming up with story ideas teaching them writing making deadlines Right and also um, attending related events that I could write about. So I, I would say like that was the bare minimum for a writer. And I mean mm-hmm. at that time I also had the opportunity to handle a few projects uh, for Shape because the team was so lean that everybody just had to take on more things, like more roles. Right, right. Yeah. Like it was really a three-person team in, in the editorial <laughs> team, like two writers and one editor. For Shape. Yeah, it was like that. Oh gosh. I mean, we were lucky in the, in the sense that because we were a licensed title, so we had the opportunity to pick up content from the US print magazine. Mm. So that helped a bit. Mm. Yeah, so for us, the, the focus was always to, on how to create like, very localized content for women's health and fitness. Mm. So health and fitness were my beats at Shape, and it was something that I, I was really very passionate about. Um, so as I transitioned from the writer role to editor role, then it became like suddenly I had to oversee a few other things, uh, basically everything that had to do with the title because it was also the time where the team downsized even further. Huh? From yeah. three to two or what? Um, okay, so from two writers, it became one writer. Oh. Yeah, so I only had one writer and one intern. Luckily, we had an intern with us and then we also had an art team Right, think, right, right. Um, it also the art team also downsized from two to one person, so it it was essentially like a three person team, me, the art director, and my writer plus an intern. Yeah, honestly, these are things that people won't know, right? Like because everybody see oh shape magazine, oh what a big publication, <laughs> hey it's shapes everywhere, right? In US, in UK, um, and then we have shape here. So, but actually, it's home by oh my gosh, this small, tight. Uh, you, I don't know you, you have to be united <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, and I'm very thankful work. I had a very good team mm, mm. I mean we, we kind of stayed together for the last couple of years so we, we knew how to work together yeah, and I think yeah. like when it comes to getting jobs done we were good at it and we were yeah. quite efficient mm. and I think also the fact that um, you know Shape is considered a very niche very small title I mean yes. the expectations are much different from compared to her world right, for right. sure Mm. Yeah, so I think we had the opportunity and the autonomy to run a lot of things and make and decisions. explore, right? Yeah. Yes, mm. and because like if we just wanted to keep to our domain, which is mainly health fitness, um, it was very easy to do that, and like we didn't really have to make a lot of hard decisions in a sense about like what kind of topics to be covering because it always had to be related to health and fitness, right? Right, right. So that kind of like made my life um quite easy on the content front. Um, I think the challenge would really just be how, how we could have uh, maintained commercially viable as a brand because um, to be honest, the advertising revenue has been going down, like declining over the last 10 years. So it was an ongoing challenge already. 
Mm. So I think at that time when I took over Shape, we did continue with the print title for about a year before we had to stop, discontinue it mm. as part of like the cost management strategies and went eventually online. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So back then when we went online, I was also like, by then I w- it was down to just a one-man team, just me. I, w- I mean like it makes sense because we no longer had to produce print, right? So we didn't yes. need an art person to be doing like the layout and designing stuff. So like, for about a year, Close to a year, yeah, I was like basically working on my own, like mm. just helming the Shape website. I mean, back then the plan was to capitalize on Shape Run because Shape Run had historically brought in a lot of like revenue for us. Right. You know, like because of the reach, the amount of participants we had, and like the I think it just had like the brand. I mean, the brand by itself, it's it's uh it speaks for itself. Yeah, yeah, and and because of that, you know, a lot of brands uh love investing in Shape Run. And that was why we thought like, okay, uh, maybe we could make events like the strategy for 2020. And then COVID happened. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. So like uh, this mass event plan totally went up in flames in a way. Like <laughs> it, just, it was just not meant to be. And I think uh, for the good of the company, because after all, SPH um, owns, owns this shape Singapore title, right? So there was this like management decision to just cut it, to okay. just discontinue it. Right, yeah. right, right. So I guess that that was um, part of the reason why I moved to her world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was offered this position at her world as um, digital editor. And I think I have never really been able to um, go very deep in terms of like just focusing on digital content because back at Shape, I had to oversee every single thing like from events um, to teaching ideas to clients yeah. and the writing, the editing, everything. So I think her world being a much bigger title and the flagship title for SPH magazines um, mm. was a good opportunity for me to kind of step up and improve myself, you know, in terms of my digital content skills. Mm, mm. Yeah. So it's an opportunity instead. Yeah, yeah, I do. I see it as an opportunity. <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, and girl. also at the same time, just being more acquainted with the different, um, different topics. Like I didn't use to cover fashion that fashion. much. Yeah, yeah, I mean, at Shape, the idea of fashion was like mainly active wear and shoes, right? But at her world, fashion is everything else. It's like watches and jewelry. It is so your perfumes and makeup to um... yeah, and even like beauty content that that I never used to deal with. So I think it's all good. Um, just shows me that I need to keep adapting and learning. You know, I mean, we can't we can't be stagnating, right? So I think I'm I'm taking this role up with like an open mind. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely that's absolutely awesome. Because uh, I mean, professionally, um, that's what moms do anyway. As per everybody, right? We, we evolve over our career over the years, um, and, and we grow in uh, different aspects. Then, um, then in terms of uh, personally, were you an um active uh, person like before you became a mom? Okay, so I was active in the sense like I had a a workout plan that I would keep to almost um, on a weekly basis. And it was just purely more for like weight maintenance. You know, like a lot of many girls, like when I started working out regularly, it was really like to number one, lose weight and be able to wear tight fitting clothes and look good in them. Like what, that and, was like when you were in JC, like I want to keep moving, Yeah, right? because there was this like um, huge pressure in JC. I think it was the group I was hanging out with. We all had a lot of body issues. And then we just like got sucked into it and it became so ingrained in me that even after JC, like I told myself, I still have to keep it up. Like we don't have PE lessons anymore, but I still have to keep on running. Mm. Like running was the one thing that I realized I could do out of so many things during PE class. Like... <laughs> I feel at my standing broad jumps, I'm not that great at push-ups. No, it's like, uh, okay, I can do sit and reach very well, but like, who really cares about flexibility? I mean, it's important, la, but then at that time for me, it's like, oh, then if I can do running, then I'll run more. La. Then also when I was running more, then I realized that I was losing weight and becoming leaner. So then it became like um, running. Like became... a positive reinforcement because yeah. it helped you to achieve what you wanted in your it mind. It did, it did. And then yeah. I, I think at that point also, I just wanted to keep like pushing myself and proving to myself that I could do something that maybe other people couldn't because 
you know, in JC, um, I come from Anderson JC, right? Where we had to all score gold in our NAFA. And then you so pressurizing because I couldn't, like, I kept feeling, I kept getting like uh, bronze or silver for my standing broad jump. And it was like, because if you don't get a gold standard for all the exercises, you fail. You basically fail. It's considered like a fail, right? So I think yeah. that part, yeah. um, it made me very, very demoralized because it made me feel like, oh, just because I can't do something, like a jump, then I'm not worthy of this. It's like, I'm not fit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think it, it, it did question my, um, my definition of fitness and it, it makes me think about it all the time because I, I remember when I failed my NAFA, then I even had to go back to do makeup PE during, during holidays. <laughs> during holidays. It was even worse, like even more crushing for my ego because it's like all my friends are just at home chilling out, you know, going out you know, on dates, and then I was going back to school to run, and they made me run laps, like eight laps every hey, lap. Wait, 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 which year were you in Anderson? 2004 and 2005. Okay, I wasn't in there yet. Um, no, so anyway, I'm from AJC too. Were you teaching? <laughs> were you one of the teachers? No. <laughs> Like, oh my gosh, for the small world. Okay, no, so I was from Anderson. Then I went back to teach. Oh. So just possible. now when you were talking about Nafa, I'm like, you do know I was a P teacher, right? <laughs> I knew, but I didn't know you taught at Anderson. No, so, so no, when I graduated, I, because my degree was in HR, so I went to Starhub to work for three years before I decided, okay, the cubicle is not for me. And um, <laughs> then I went to NIE for P school and then I went back to AJ um, as a P teacher. So wow. I was there in uh, twin, end of, so second half of 2009, yeah, 2009, all the way to 2013, I think, before I um, yeah, stopped teaching and then I came out and do um, fit mommy stuff. Right. <laughs> Maybe if I met you then in AJ, if you were my teacher, I wouldn't have felt so bad. <laughs> Um. Uh. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I think teachers make a big difference. Yeah, they do. Right. They do. Yeah, they do. Um, it is. It is also part and parcel. One of the reasons why I was so adamant about um, getting back my fitness at that time, getting back my fitness, uh, my power, my strength, and all. Because I mean, I was still teaching. I didn't want to go back to school to teach, and then like the teachers and uh, the kids or the girls see like, "Hey, Miss Lai is back." Yeah. After her twin, she's like. Not like before or yeah, I miss like after a kid, she's like. So I didn't want the kids to have this kind of impression, right? Mm. For for women, like you know, to, to have that impression embedded in them that you know, once a woman has a has a child or has children, then you know, she forgets about her own health and you know physical abilities. Mm. So that was when I was very adamant about, you know, must <laughs> find my strength and power back. And, and I mean, I eventually did, of course, and then I went back, I continued teaching, and then, and then you know, boys, we train them for NS, right? They have mm-hmm. to do their pull-ups. So then when I pull, the boys have nothing to say, they have to try their best to pull, because if Miss Lai, a female, can do it, they can do it too. Mm-hmm. Um, so really, that was uh, one of the strongest impetus <laughs> at that time. <laughs> That's so inspiring. <laughs> that yeah. you have to walk the talk, more, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Walk the talk. So yeah, that that's what teaching is basically. <laughs> Motherhood found you. So how did yeah, so... this uh, physical activity evolve then? Um, you know, as you reached motherhood, or uh, sorry, entered motherhood. <laughs> I think when I continued my running after JC, it was still very much a weight loss uh, plan. It was more like, okay, I don't want to gain weight, right? Because the motivation for scared. it was really, you know, to control weight. Yes, because I was very scared, like, entering the workforce that I would become like everybody else around me and just keep gaining weight over the years. Because I always hear about all these horror stories, right? Like, how, like, oh, five years, ten years in your work, um, you start piling on the kids. It's so true, right? right? Yes, yes, right? yes. Because People always say that. Yes. Activity and all that. So, um, my first job was actually at Changi General Hospital. I was working in a cop comms position. So back then, I, it was also pretty health-focused and I knew like, okay, running is quite important, you know, for, for my weight loss and also like overall health. Mm. So I think um, when I got to join Shape, then it kind of changed my perspective a little because um, gradually as I became, as I got to discover new ways of working out, like new exercises, um, new types of classes, then it just opened my mind to like, oh, there are so many types of cardio out there. I don't have to just run. I don't have to just swim. I also used to do just swimming and running. Yeah, so 
I think even discovering things like short bursts of exercise can also be helpful. It doesn't have to be like a 30 minute, 40 minute session to count as a workout. I think that really opened my mind. Mm. And then also um, discovering yoga when I joined Shape. Um, it was something that I always, I knew about it, but then I never got Just never got it. down to trying it. Yeah, and, yeah. and didn't really know much about like, okay, why is it so great? Like, why do people swear by yoga and all that? So mm. I tried it out for myself and I, um, to this day, I'm still practicing it and I feel like yoga is something that I can always turn to because it really grounds me mentally and it helps to keep me sane. So mm. yoga is really more like um, my, my form of therapy. Mm, mm. And, and I think like uh, at Shape, running became a little bit obligatory because <laughs> when I discovered so many fun exercises right, and running became like one of the most boring things yes, ever. Yes, <laughs> it became like, oh man, do I still want to run? Like, because I have so many other cool things to do. I like, I have hit classes, you know, that is like uh, the TRX kind of training. And then there, were, there was bar, there was Pilates. So basically so many options. And also the fact yeah. that my job allowed me to attend all these different fitness events and try them out. So I think it made me um, really open up my world to workouts and made me very, very fickle when it came to a workout plan. <laughs> the, the one question I really dreaded at shape was when people asked me, so what do you do for your workouts regularly? Because I always tell them like, I actually don't I have do a, a regular plan. <laughs> yeah, it's really what is happening that week and what I feel like doing, you know? Mm. So yeah, I think back at shape, it wasn't that regular anymore running. Like I would only run in seasons, like closer to shape run when I knew, okay, I have to train for it because I have to do the run. When you're preparing for an event. Yeah, so yeah. then running became like, okay, it's part of a work thing because we have shape run. So mm. I, would, I would start my running in, say, June to prepare for the run in August. Mm. So mm. then, yeah, it was a very seasonal thing. And then like after August, I would like just slack off, stop running and do other things already. Mm. So I think that was uh, what it was at shape. But then I think um, once I became a mom, uh, I think running has become so much more precious to me right now because it's the most accessible thing I can do for myself. Yes. Yes. Yeah, anytime, almost anytime I want. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, that's 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 the reality, right? Um, whatever activities that we do or physical activities that um us women can engage in, really, it revolve evolves and changes over the different stages of life, right? Basically, um, it's also important to find something that interests you, plus is accessible to you at different stages, depending on you know what you're handling or what you are thrown with and uh, and I guess um, for, 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 for moms especially it's about finding that thing and finding that thing or finding that activity that really works for you at a point in time to keep you active so for you then running once again became something that's accessible and easy for you to do right during motherhood yes then I realized it's much easier for me to go for a quick run than say Go for a class, right? Yes. Yeah, like nobody has time for that because then you have to plan, you have to book the class, then you have to show up and travel there. So it's a lot more barriers to it. Whereas like um, running, I can basically like put on my shoes and head out of the house. And I think it's the heading out of the house part that really keeps me going because I just want to be outside. I just want the, the feeling of freedom, you know, mm, to be mm, away mm, from mm, my kids. Mm, mm, mm. It's true, that's it's true. what is what makes running so appealing to me right now. Not that I enjoy the process of running, but it's more about the environment I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the part about running away from the kids, I think uh, every mom can uh, attest to that. <laughs> yeah, it's like even half an hour, it, it just does a lot to my soul. <laughs> it is, it is. Yeah, so uh, so right now, would you say you, you are doing more of like yoga plus running? Yeah. So interchange so maybe... between these two activities? Yeah, I, I will say on a weekly basis, I try to do two runs a week and just one yoga session. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I have a yoga package currently. So I try to make it for class because I find it more motivating to, to actually be in a physical class. Mm -hmm. But now that the studios have to be closed for the next three weeks, I'm a bit torn. Like, should I continue? Should I go for like the online Zoom classes or should I you know, suspend my package? Mm. Uh, I think it really depends on your instructor because I do know uh, another fellow mommy who um, has a membership with Real Yoga and the instructor at Real does very good. Um, I mean, even on Zoom, he, had, he, he does very good. He delivers very good lessons as well. So really up to your instructor, right? <laughs> Whether the yeah, teacher is great with that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, otherwise, honestly, think, there are many options. Besides going for yoga classes, I think sometimes, you know, at the end of a work day, if I feel like stressed out or I really need to just decompress or just head to my yoga mat and do some simple exercises or stretches and I already feel better after that. So mm. like, to me, that's, that also counts as yoga. It doesn't have to be like physically attending a yoga class. It is, it is, it is. I mean, the... Uh, uh... Honestly, the, the whole idea or the whole purpose of you know teaching people fitness, teaching people how to move is to empower them or every single one of us to have the ability to do it on our own. Right? If someone has to, I don't know, keep relying on classes or an instructor to do something, uh, yeah, it might be good for the instructor because that's um that's fees. <laughs> that's your earning fees. But in a sense, if um someone is continuously reliant, then I don't think we've met the objective after all, right? Or they come maybe because they enjoy the community and the class and the people they meet and then the camaraderie of the, um, the classmates. Uh, that, that's another aspect um, which is important for classes as well. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, for me personally, uh, that, that's always my goal. Empower the mom with the things she needs to know what to do so that she can do any time of the day mm. when she can find the slot, right? Mm. Doesn't, she doesn't need to be dependent on me, dependent on her husband or anyone. Yeah, right. I, I think that's a really good goal to have. Mm. Complications or um, any issues with uh, pregnancies and birth during the, the pregnancy period? Okay, so for my first one, um, because she wasn't a planned pregnancy, I think like, I always just like, okay, um, I mean, I knew eventually I wanted to be a mom. Like, I just didn't know like it would come so early. So early. But then like, I just decided to embrace it anyway. Um, so I didn't really think about making a lot of changes to my diet in terms of like nutrition. I just thought, like, okay, just do things as per normal. But apparently, like when I reached almost the end of my second trimester, so my gynae told me that okay, your baby isn't growing very well. Like, are you eating? Uh, are you are you eating properly? Mm. So I think and I was never really that aware about my diet, and I think uh, back then I was very much into sweet stuff like mm. I really have a sweet tooth and then during the pregnancy it just made my sweet tooth worse so I, I didn't I wasn't really like looking at my protein intake for example and ensuring that I was like eating in a very balanced way mm. so I think when she told me that then it became like um just it like it just hit me that like you know I have to be more responsible for what I eat and right. she was basically trying to tell me you need, you need to eat more protein eat more eggs eat more beef because like your baby needs all these nutrients. But I don't know whether it was really uh, because I was lacking in protein, but then I decided to just listen to her and had to force feed myself and make myself eat a lot more meat. Because right. for me, it's like when I'm outside and I don't get the kind of protein that I expect, uh, then I wouldn't even order it. Like for example, uh, I didn't really like to eat chicken, right? And then all around me, the options for chicken are fried chicken. Like that's the easiest protein you can find when you are yeah. eating outside. Yeah. If it's not fried chicken, then it's fried fish. And I didn't want like fried options. Yeah. So back then, I would, what I would do is, okay, then I'll just skip it entirely and I'll just eat carbs. You know, or just eat eggs. So yes. I think it, it just like um, occurred to me that, okay, even fried chicken is protein. So maybe I really should just eat it if there's no other better option around. So that's what I had to do like during that period. Um, because my gynae was like saying, look, if your baby continues to have that standard growth, um, like not putting on weight, then we might have to induce you like, as early as 32 weeks. So, right. Like, that really made me freak out. Like, I think she's also a very harsh gynae who <laughs> doesn't think about what she's saying. Like, she doesn't really uh, care about how you feel. So, like, back then as a young mom, I think I was, like, 28 mm. when I had my first kid. So, like, I really felt so affected by it. Like, I felt like it was a threat from her. Like, if you don't if you don't improve your baby's condition, then like we'll we have to, take, to get her, take out. her out. Yeah, <laughs> so it was like a, <laughs> it was terrible because like it affected my mental health also. And then it made me even more stressed. Did you so, change your gynae for the second one? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't that, she wasn't that bad after all. <laughs> like she delivers all these hard truths, right? And then she makes me stressed and anxious. But at the end of the day, I was still very thankful for her advice, you know, and, and very thankful for her performance during the delivery. I mean, I think she did well and in the aftercare as well. So I 
honestly, like I thought like it wasn't worth it to change a new gynae and have to, you know, get used to her again. Mm-hmm. And it may not even be a change for the better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's true, I'm the it's kind true. of person like, you know, if I can run, then I will run more. I'll just deal with it. <laughs> like, like because professionally she did nothing wrong. It's just it, it's it's just a way of delivery which she's I gonna deliver it to you, then you will do it. Yeah. Just and, send it out to you. <laughs> And then she doesn't care. And then she at, at one point she just told me very harshly, it's not about you anymore, it's about the baby. You know? And then like it really, really hit me hard. It's like, okay, so now that I'm pregnant, then I really have to think about somebody else and more than just myself. Mm. Yeah. So so then you you were not expecting the pregnancy, you went through it, and then um after after baby is born, how how were you doing the recovery? Okay, so thankfully, right, I managed, I, I made myself eat a lot of meat and managed to gain more weight in the last trimester and my baby started growing, so it was all fine. Um, like, she she came out, like, two days before the EVD, which was, like, quite good, like, and everything was natural, right? Um, Recovery-wise, I think, um, definitely wasn't expecting myself to feel so weak and so tired after mm. the childbirth. Yeah, I think, like, even though I had read up about it and hear, heard about it, I think nothing really prepared me for that kind of like um, mental uh, drain, emotional drain and like physical drain that I felt after that. It's like, okay, now that the baby is out, but there are still so many things to work on in terms of recovery. It's like, mm. um, first of all, like the healing from the vagina delivery because my doctor had to cut me. I mean, she asked, uh, she asked to cut like, because she said that it would be cleaner. So I said, yeah, sure, do whatever you want. Uh. <laughs> I mean, whatever you think is good, just do, you know. Um, so I had to recover from that. And then there was like the post, um, the postpartum bleeding, right? So she told me that it would last for like four to six weeks max. But then mine went on to like eight weeks. So I was really very annoyed. Um, and then I had to like keep calling up the clinic, asking, yeah, why, uh, why am I still bleeding? You know, I thought it should be over. And then they will keep telling me things that I, I also things like, oh, I think it's like maybe hormonal imbalance, that kind of thing. Because they say as long as it's not heavy bleeding, then there's no cause for concern. Yeah, mine wasn't heavy. Like, it was just like a period that wouldn't stop. So right, it, right. it felt a bit annoying. Yeah, so I just had, I just continued with uh, whatever they say. They just say, oh, just monitor. Like if it's heavy bleeding, then you call us. Or if you see clots. Mm. But there was none of that. So anyway, I had the bleeding for like eight weeks. Um, yeah before it finally stopped so there was one and then also I think like just trying to accept my post-pregnancy body was quite hard because like every day I was just like look in the mirror and staring at my stomach it's like okay uh, this is not my stomach yeah it still looks like five six months pregnant and then the skin felt so loose and then uh, I think the advice that my gynae gave me I think all gynees will say is oh breastfeed your baby because it will help your uterus contract that faster right but I think I was also worried that it wouldn't. Uh, that for me, I'm just like thinking how long would it take for my body to go back to what it was before pregnancy? And and like would I ever like would my womb really shrink back to its normal size? Mm. I think like, that that was a big concern of mine. Mm. Yeah. And I think like also hearing from other people how like because my sis also had a kid in the same year as me. So she right. she was advising me to wear like a belly binder. Mm. she even passed it to me and she said oh you have to put it on like when you sleep at night it will help it will help you like I don't know I don't like there's no science behind it I think because I, I really tried researching about it like it just says it will help your 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 womb contract back faster help you regain your shape and all that then I, I tried to put it on but I think the first um, after my first pregnancy I was sweating so much and so badly <laughs> like I, I couldn't deal with it like it just made me very very stuffy even though I was in the aircon room I was still sweating and then you asked me to put on the belly binder so it was stifling la. and then to me it's like I'm not going to do anything I'm not comfortable with so within a few hours I just like took it off and I'm like okay I'm not wearing this <laughs> then my mom was scolding me and saying like why aren't you listening you know did you did you uh, engage a jamu lady I didn't. So there was another massage and all that. I heard about that from my cousin and she said like it was very, very effective because like the the the, the therapist will come in on day two or day three, right? And start doing it. But it just sounded too painful. And I think at that point, like at day two or day three, I was just so tired and 
feeling very emotional that I don't think I would have been able to go through that session, you know. Mm, mm, Had a mm. therapist come in and still like rub my body and, you know, twist and massage it. I don't think uh, I would be comfortable with that mm. level uh, of yeah. touch. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's really up to... every Everyone has their different uh, choice and choices and strategies, right, uh, to handle and manage the postpartum period. Um, just to make you feel better. Yeah, there's really no white paper on... Um, on uh, binders, on how effective binders are for, for helping in, you know, the abdominal muscles um, getting back into the original form. Um, and that is also why, uh, I mean, I couldn't find anything to... <laughs> but I was very insecure for some reason because I saw a lot of new moms on Instagram using it. And then it they'll be like true. showing before and after. But I feel like there's no fair comparison because you wouldn't know what your shape would be if you didn't use the binder, right? It is true. So, and that's what we were talking about earlier, right? Social media is such a... <laughs> Can I say that? I was like, so somebody must do the... <laughs> such a bitch. Yeah, especially during the postpartum period, it is horrible. Um, but anyway, wait, before I go on social media, so just to, just to share with everybody, yeah, there's no white paper to prove that. I mean, for me personally, as a trained person, I couldn't find any information as well. And there's no... I reached out to a few gynees here and nobody could talk about diastasis or the abdominal separation because the whole point of the binder is to help your um, abdominal muscles get back into its proper form and shape, right? Uh, and to flatten your tummy. Mm. And I wanted to know whether the binders are... Is it true or not? Is it, or is it just something that's traditional that's being passed down and we just continue doing it? So honestly, there's no white paper. But I guess you can see the binder as like a ankle gut if someone sprains or breaks the ankle right then they have the tendency to wrap it up to protect it right um, but the point is if you don't rehabilitate that sprained ankle you don't um, strengthen it properly again and you don't uh, exercise or you know train the flexibility and all the ankle will still be as broken and sprained as ever even with everything wrapped outside to protect yeah. it <laughs> so treat the binder as the same as um what you would an ankle guard or a knee guard because at the end of the day you still have to solve the root of the problem which is inside and strengthening from inside out so that's what I that that's the analogy I always use the simplest analogy to you know um, explain to people uh, that's what the belly binder do and jamu massages same analogy but I always say um, but always still ask your husband to pay for it because who doesn't enjoy a good massage to relax the body <laughs> Right? And they're really good at what they do because sometimes they deal with the, you know, the water retention stuff and then they do all the um, different point massages. Just get daddy to pay for it and then you just enjoy that one hour of auntie to come and massage. Too late, too late. And did you um, get yourself healed, recover and feel better again? I think it was um, to feel like emotionally better. I turned to a few people for support. Like they were typically like not my closest friends because my closest friends uh, back then were either not married or didn't have kids. So I actually turned to my older friends who already had kids. Mm. And like they became my, like my crucial pillars of support during those few months, uh, mm. like especially mm. the first six months of having a kid. Because then they were the people I would turn to when I wanted to ask about breastfeeding, for example, bottle feeding, you know, um, and all sorts of other like parenting things that I wanted to know. If not, then I would just be trying to find some answers online, you know, on some like pregnancy forum or pregnancy site, uh, which sometimes it, it was comforting sometimes, but at other times you would just raise more questions when mm. my experience doesn't gel with what I'm seeing online. Yes. And I'll be always questioning, like, questioning is my baby right. normal? Am I, what? Is, is what I'm doing normal? Is my breastfeeding good? Is it like mm. actually correct? Mm. So like all these questions and I think like at the back of my mind, breastfeeding was something that made me very insecure um, mm. throughout the first few months because I, I always thought like, oh, I, I think I need like a lactation consultant to come and see and check whether I, I'm doing it properly. Mm. Yeah. So I think the, a lot of insecurities came from that and I think I didn't get much support from like my immediate family members because like uh, my sis was away she was like in the states 
And then mm. my mom back then, she just breastfed us when we were kids. She had no idea what was a pump. She has never like used an electric pump before. And I think if she ever had to express milk, it was through the hand. Oh, you have a very I mean, advanced like, mom. She breastfed you, you and your siblings? She did. She breastfed all three of us. Oh. And, uh, for me, she did it for six months even. I, I don't know how she did it. Because back then, there, I don't think there was such a concept of like using an electric pump to store your milk. So she didn't do all that. I think in the daytime, I would be probably formula fed by the nanny or maybe fed like a combination of like breast milk and formula milk and then at night she'll come back home to breastfeed. Mm, that's interesting. Huh? You probably should ask her about that. Because yeah. I mean, it's just interesting to understand how um, uh, mom- mothers from different generations uh, handle or manage uh, all these uh, chal- uh, ch- different challenges. Because um, these days, if let's say we don't have the palm, then how do you do with engorgement and things like that, right? Uh, of course, there are ways you can just, you know, um, get rid of the milk. Um, but was that what they, they re- she really did? Yeah, <laughs> that would be interesting to find out. She told me actually. that she used her hand to express. So maybe she, that's what she did, you know, without a palm. Mm-hmm. And I'm just so impressed because like, I can't imagine using my own hands to squeeze the milk out. Like, it would be so hard. That, that was me, actually, for the twins. I could only do hand expression. None of the, I mean, the pumps didn't work because um, the flow was so little. And if I use pumps, I just find I'm wasting milk. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, because the twins were small. They were premies, right? They were born 1 kilo and 1.1 kilo, uh, 1.6 kilo. So at the initial stage when they were in NICU, the nurse was like, they can only take breast milk. They cannot take formula because they're too small. Um, so then the pressure was on me to really, mommy, then every day I visit them, every day the nurse was like, mommy, where's my mom? <laughs> mommy got bring my mom. Oh, so stressful. Mm. Stressful is one thing. And then the milk flow didn't come for after how many months also didn't really come. Uh, initial, at the initial stage, it was okay because, um, I mean, they only need, needed one ml, two ml per feet, right? They were so tiny. Then slowly it became 10 ml per feet, 15 ml per feet. And then, but the books didn't keep up with whatever. So, but I still continue to um, express as much I, as I can. And because the quantity is so little, I find that every time I use the pump, and you know there's the flannel and all that, right? And then some milk will, will, will spread, you know, on all these, all these little parts and joints and gadgets, lah, right? Yes. And you waste every, you waste a lot of drops. <laughs> No, but isn't hand expressing worse? Because like the milk can spill everywhere. Right? It can no, so you take the bottle. It's going to be whoever's watching this. Uh, you just going to open a bottle. <laughs> so you take the bottle. The bottle is, uh, has a mouth, right? Then you just like, then you squeeze directly inside. So every single drop will be in the bottle. So pretty much it was uh, hard as well because all the, because for, I don't know how many hours, if you edit up the whole day, right? How many hours a day I'm just doing this? Because you have to be in this position to, Go in right, like, like if you do upright position, it doesn't really work this way. So, so you gotta, mm. oh, my back, my everywhere. Oh my god! And then squeeze until you know the hands are like, um, the wrists are tired, yeah. fingers are have some tension going on as well. <laughs> ah, oh That's my god! Amazing! I don't, I don't know how you did it. So hand expression. Imagine. Yeah. yeah. Like, no, so it's interesting to you know sometimes have. Uh, I mean, if you have the opportunity, just check with your mommy. Hey, how did you do, do it last time with the three of us? And then she had to work. Did she go back for, to work? Yes, she went back after. Yeah, months, exactly, you know? exactly right. Because back then, the maternity leave was only like two months. Maybe maybe even shorter or no maternity leave. I cannot... Or one month. Or yeah, like I think that yeah. Their, their generation, the maternity leave is almost nothing. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think so. Than... Yeah, so it'd be interesting to ask her because this day some of the ladies are like, oh my god, asking for the world. Uh, cannot without this, cannot do that, without this, cannot do that. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe sometimes it's perspective, right? After you after yeah. you understand, hey, what the previous generation did from a mom who breastfed. I mean, because their generation, a lot of mothers are formula mummy. Like I was formula fed too. So it's not uncommon. It's so it is actually quite uncommon to hear, hey, our generation here are breastfed. So <laughs> yeah, I think my mom was great. And then all three of us were also delivered vaginally without epidural. Yeah, so please ask her, okay? <laughs> Share her experience. <laughs> okay. Right. So with your experience of having number one, uh, did you do anything different for number two? In terms of like after delivery, 
Mm, even during pregnancy, like, were you more, and also because you were with shape, you're more exposed to different types of fitness. You must have understood about uh, pregnancy, some different pregnancy exercises or uh, fitness programs. Were you, uh, were you attracted to, you know, try anything? Okay, so with my first pregnancy, I was a bit too cautious because, like, my gynae back then was very conservative. And she would tell me things like, okay, no running at all. And exercises, if you are going to do them, it has to be very light and low impact. So um, during my first pregnancy, all I did was prenatal yoga. Hmm. And I thought back then like, okay, it'll be enough to kind of like maintain some form of strength for me. Because like for prenatal yoga, they'll focus on strengthening some key muscle groups, right? Like the core, um, the thighs especially. Hmm. And also I think the wrists. Mm. Yeah, so so I think it wasn't enough. Like I felt after my first pregnancy, I was weaker than ever, and I was not strong enough to actually carry my baby mm. and breastfeed my baby mm. and because all these requires, um, like say some sort of endurance, like, requires, strength, endurance. Yeah, and yeah. and and kind of wrist strength is very important. Yeah, so with my first one, I actually had thumb tendonitis for a year after she was born. Oh. Um, like the, this, this whole part, right? Like I couldn't bend it. And then it would hurt so much. I couldn't move my wrist like this. I could only move like maybe like this a bit. And yeah. Any more than that, it would hurt so bad. And then I mm. couldn't, it was so weak that I couldn't even open my tinkat to eat during my confinement. <laughs> so oh, I felt man. so bad about myself. It's like, huh? This, this pregnancy, like, it gave me a child, but then it took away so much of so my So many strength, things, you know? right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I felt so helpless. Like, oh, I even needed mm. someone around me to open open the thing card container for me. Then it, it made me feel very lousy. La. So I think for my second pregnancy, I tried to focus more on these areas. Like, I know that, okay, my, my wrists are not very strong. So I, I tried to do more exercises uh, to improve that. Mm. And then I did more, like, body weight. Uh, body weight exercises, you know, mm. like the simple planks and everything, mm. and and continue with my my exercise classes as much as I could at that time. Like as mm. long as it's not high impact, I will, I will still continue to do it. So my um, I think my outlook on exercise during my second pregnancy was more like okay, as long as I can keep up with the exercises and I I think that they are good for me, I will continue to do them. Mm, mm. So I think it helped because I I. I managed to stay active throughout the whole of my second pregnancy compared to my first one. Yeah, and then that's awesome. Somehow, like the first one when my baby wasn't going well, my, my gynae actually told me don't exercise. It's like <laughs> just stop whatever you're doing and rest. Like she just wants me to have bed rest. So I think that was another thing that crushed me. Because I'm like, huh? But you put me on bed rest and it makes me even more stressed, you know, because I cannot move. Because mm-hmm. yeah, the concern the- is really always safety for safety for the baby. Mm, yeah, mm. but I felt so bitter back then because it was like taking away another another form of freedom that I had. So my second one, I was lucky like I didn't have major complications at all. So I could still mm. continue with my normal activities uh, mm. and try to stay active as much as possible. Uh. So I think it it also helped because doing so for the whole nine months of the pregnancy, after I delivered, I, I didn't feel as weak as I was the first time around. Mm. Um, but I think the difference will be like I took a longer time to recover from my second pregnancy like in terms of like the womb shrinking back and all that. Mm. Yeah. That probably is normal. <laughs> the time <laughs> the time gets longer with every pregnancy. Mm. So maybe the third one you will expect to be a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> Plus oh. also age, right? As we grow older, um, our recovery, our speed of recovery uh, usually declines. Uh, as opposed to let's say we we had if we have a baby at 23, 24 years old. Mm. Yeah. Age also plays a plays a part. <laughs> yes. Or how I long did it take I... to get you back into running? Wow. I need to think about it. <laughs> <It's so laughs> I cannot remember I still having baby brain. <laughs> <laughs> it's like after having kids, right? I just have very selective memory. Like I only remember things that I, I think worth, like, worth yeah, remembering. like suddenly my life is not worth remembering anymore. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like when I got back into into shape or when I started running again, it's really quite hazy. But I I remember like just telling myself to chill after my second pregnancy and just not put any pressure on myself to go back to my workout routine mm-hmm. as long as I um I just wanted to be like mentally good, like you know mentally healthy. 
and feeling up for exercise before I were to think about it. Mm, mm. So I didn't set yes. any hard deadlines. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's, so, so, that's, so, that's so important, right? Um, yeah. I think it's great that you managed to, you know, even come to this conclusion that you have to be well mentally first before you think about the physical well-being. Well, not physical yeah. well-being. I mean, of course, physical well-being, you need to be good, but more like, you know, physical goals, right? But yeah, up here yeah. must be correct first or, you know, take care of this here first. Yes, because like after having a second kid, it just gets harder and harder, right? The more kids you have. So I also had to deal with like the guilt towards my firstborn, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm, know, adapting mm-hmm. to two kids in my life. So mm-hmm. I think um, really getting back to running was not on, on my priority list at all. Mm-hmm. It was more about like, okay, I just want to eat well. I just want to like be healthy, not fall sick, have enough milk for my baby. That's all I cared about and Mm. at the same time be strong enough to be able to do the daily baby chores you know like changing Mm. diapers breastfeeding carrying and all that Mm. Mm. but was there was there a point in time where you felt like okay I'm ready to you know be a little bit more uh, involved in uh, participating in more physical activities or try something harder I think it was once I returned to work because uh, being at shape I can't exactly like turn down activities right mm. um, I just have to like just keep an open mind and I think by the time I returned to work after four months I was more or less um, ready to take on some mm. activities mm. but I always reminded myself to just start light start small mm. and, and just don't over push myself so I was a lot more like mindful of, of, of myself like mm. what my body can do and what I feel up to do mm. Yeah, so I think I eased into it with um, simpler things like uh, lower impact stuff like, mm. you know, yoga, pilates. And then running was more like maybe close to a year after I delivered. Then I would start running. Yes. Because yes. back then, uh, running still wasn't on my priority. It was like, okay, I'd rather do something more effective in terms of like fat burn. So like for a short amount of time, if I can do a HIIT workout, I would rather do that. Yeah, yeah, go for a run. Yeah, yeah. Because um, in in reality, running does take much a much longer time. Yes. yes. Yeah, you and sometimes we just can't invest that amount of time uh, to make effective as running as uh, we want it to be. Yeah, I remember like starting out by kind of like preparing myself to ease into my ease back into my fitness routine by doing my own exercises at home. Mm. Like I would do things like mountain climbers, I'll do burpees, I'll do lunges and all that. Like mm. just trying to get my form in order and make sure that I still have the strength to do it. And then mm. slowly scale up, like mm. scale up in terms of the reps and the sets. Right. Yeah. right. Do your kids see you when you are exercising or working out? Do they like come and touch you and uh, want to try and join whatever you're doing? So if I want to be serious about it, like if I really, okay, uh, Today I have a goal, okay, I want to do like 20 squat jumps, 20 mountain climbers, 20 burpees, that kind of thing. Then I will make sure that they're not around if I'm doing all this. Because <laughs> it's like more explosive, right? I cannot do it with that, with, when they're around. Like, yes, yes. Number one, they will kind of distract me or I might lose my focus. Number two, it's also dangerous like, because they might run towards me and they might and, just and, like... And you don't, you, yeah, and you don't notice that, hey, suddenly they are under yeah. my feet. <laughs> Correct. So those are the things I wouldn't do when they're around. But then when they are around and I still want to like squeeze in a quick workout, I will do more static exercises, right. like wall sits, like holding a plank. Mm. And these days, I think they are quite uh, interested to come around me and play with me when I'm doing planks. Like they like to sit on my back. Mm. And then I'll be forced to hold a plank with my son on my back. And it's really, really added, tough. Added challenge. No, it's like another 12 kilos on me. So, but it's good lah, because I think I'm just exposing them to all these little things that I do mm. um, are ways to get them more involved. Because mm. sometimes I see them trying to copy the exercises that I do. And at least they're aware, you know. They do. Even my 18 month, I mean, when he was 18 month old, my, my little one, yeah, he was trying to copy the brother doing some push-ups or whatever. Of course, he do it in his, I don't know, baby way. But you can see that he was actually trying to mimic, but it's <laughs> so amazing, right? They're such copycats. <laughs> yeah, and I think at that stage, they are also growing like their psychomotor skills. So it's great. Right? It's it great. Yeah, like... just let them. Mm. So, but then the reality is, yeah, that's why sometimes um, I find that uh, it is challenging, you know, when... and and, and working at shape and reading all this 
I, I bet you must have seen like hundreds of articles that say, work with your kids, work out with your kids, and, uh, and then you have all these pictures of the mommy and the kid and all that, right? But my contention has always been, but with the kid around, you really don't get a solid good workout. You cannot get a solid good workout done mm. um, because you will be disrupted for sure, right? Then number one is either you have to lower expectations of the particular workout goal that you, you set for yourself. Or number two, um, you are able to find someone to help to you know, look after them for a while while you try to deliver this, right? But if you don't have, then we have to come back to this mindset about, you know, <laughs> lowering our own expectations. Because in the reality, reality is you can never get a, a what we, what we so-called uh, know as the proper workout done whenever there are little ones around. I mean, as they get older, it's not so bad. Like when the twins are about three to four years old or four to five years old, three to four, I would say, once they are about three to four, uh, working out with them is uh, possible because I was still doing my uh, heat workout, la, dumbbells la, and all this jumping stuff out in the corridor. And then they were out there too. They took their mats out and then they were, doing, they were trying to do all the, uh, the, the wall handstands. They see me do it and they try to do the wall handstands as well and try to put their legs up on the wall <laughs> and all those stuff. Um, yeah, so three to four is still okay. But when you have like anything below, kids below three, it can be dangerous, right? Yeah. Prancing around with dumbbells with them and all that. Yes. So it's a bit, it's a bit, it can be challenging to try and get a hard workout done. For sure. With them so I think it's so important to like have a very open mindset. Just go in with an open mind. Like mm. when I'm working out, I tell myself like don't need to set hard goals. Uh, as long as you manage to squeeze out a few exercises, that's like good enough already. So yes, you know if you because that's the reality. <laughs> yeah, and and you can't you can't control the kids. What so like what for you know worry mm. about something you can't control? So. Mm. Yeah, exactly. This year, working with shape and you know meeting so many people and then uh, being exposed to so many different kind of kinds of physical activities, uh, what would you say would be the thing you value most about physical activity? Mm. Do I value most about physical activity? I think it's the fact that it allows me to discover more about myself, my body, like increases my body awareness which is something I really appreciate because like, and it makes me understand more about like my strengths and my weaknesses. Mm. So I think um, just being able to know that and like learning that, okay, you, you can do this and this to kind of build your strength and you can work on your weaknesses by doing this kind of exercises. Mm. is quite empowering. Mm. Yeah. And also, and also earlier you, you mentioned, right? Physical activity gives you an opportunity to uh, get, get out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. It's the mental health component. Like right now, um, my attitude towards workout is is going to freshen my mind. It's going to lighten my load, make me feel better after it. So it's come back a better it. mom, right? Yes, I mean that's how I justify it, la, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I no longer treat workouts as a punishment or like a goal to strike off the list because it's not there anymore. It's about like just finding that little pocket of me time for myself mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. makes me feel good because I, I did something for myself today and then I just feel good about that. Right. Uh, and there was a mom with uh, uh, two kids like you who, who one wishes to get started, you know, moving, uh, finding time to do some physical activity um, finally and do something for herself. What would you be your top three tips for her to get started? Okay, I think first of all, like for any mom who wants to get more active or start a workout routine, um, it's important to be very clear why you're doing this. So it's about like setting the goal, setting the intention, knowing why, why am I doing this? Who am I doing this for? Right? And once you are very clear about that goal, then I would say, yes, it makes sense to get started. Because mm. I think everyone needs to approach this with a sense of purpose. Mm. It's not just about, okay, I just want to work out because I see other people doing it. Or it feels... Oh, I get to take a snapshot because... and uh, post. Yeah, it has to be a deeper <laughs> sense of purpose, you know? Like, what is it doing for you? Why are you here? Yeah. So I think that that, uh, that mentality has to be there already. Mm. Um, then the second thing is, of course, to 
really, really um, not beat yourself up over goals that you don't achieve. So in fact, there's no need to set hard and fast goals. I think for any mom who is going back to a workout routine, it can be so challenging and difficult even mm. to keep to it. So I think really start small, start small, mm. go with um, scalable exercises. Yes. You know? Like don't shoot for the stars, just, <laughs> just like <laughs> reach the clouds and you're good enough. And I think that um, when you set uh, more achievable, realistic goals, it's, it's just easier like, and when you hit them you can always like say okay um, so I've done the one set that I promised myself today I can if I feel good and up for it I will do set number two yes. and that's, that's a healthy way to approach workouts instead of thinking about like okay if I don't do the three sets today then I didn't I'm lousy plan. Yeah, yeah like or that I feel uh, I cannot one <laughs> so I think it's that mentality like you cannot have that fail mentality and just uh, you have to be able to mm. celebrate every small thing you're doing for yourself because I think everything counts really mm. Mm. and of course the third thing is it's also important to get family support um, especially if you are starting a workout plan that requires uh, them to help out with looking after the children or doing house chores. I think it's important to always like get the partner or get your family members to be on board. Mm. Um, maybe just share with them. You don't have to like tell them, oh, is it okay if I go out for a one hour run? Like just say like, okay, I, I, I just need to do this, right? I need to go out for one hour. So can you help me to do this, this, this? So I think like if if you become very clear about what you're doing and mm. you share that with your family, I don't see why um, they wouldn't help and support yeah. you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like basically, everyone around you wants to support you and help you be a better, happier mom. I think mm. sometimes the toughest thing could be uh, for moms to realize that they need to ask for help or even to just share that they have these goals. You know, it's, it's about the communication and realizing that yes. you need to open up. Yes, about it. yes. Tell people what you want to achieve. Tell people what you want to do, what you want to achieve. Yeah. Most people will want to support you. Um, yeah, that, that's, 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 that's what I feel um, is uh, lacking in some, with some mothers too, that they just need to say and share. Like actually, yeah, the most I important thing I would say is to share with your spouse to get that support first. <laughs> yes. And I think like it shouldn't be like asking, but it's more about hey, I need to do this because inform um, you. <laughs> yes, it's like don't ask. Way, it's inform. Put, put this in your calendar tomorrow, like nine to ten. I won't be around. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because um, I think some of us really do need to learn. I mean, for me, at certain stages, I also had to learn this that um, I have to achieve it for myself. Uh, I'm doing it for myself. I don't need to ask for permission. Hmm. Yeah, and, right. and definitely don't feel guilty about it because there's no point. Like, if you feel guilty about the exercise, then it just makes you feel even worse after you're done. Mm. Um, every mom in Singapore is uh, very, very interested and concerned about education. <laughs> <laughs> so, if let's say you were the Minister of Education, you've took, taken over Lawrence Wong. <laughs> you have all the resources. Now it's right? Hong Chung Everything. Eh, he's taken out. Officially start already. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> Haven't, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you step in between them. <laughs> <laughs> so you have all the resources, you know, um, all the monetary support. But what would be one thing that you will implement as a Minister of Education? Oh, this is a very tough question because there are so Anything, many things. Let, let your imagination run wild. Just one thing, right, that you, you wish that, you know, you could implement in Singapore for the kids. I think um, one important thing would be to teach children um, the importance of helping out at home, right, doing house chores. So I think I would like to see more of that. Um, maybe maybe being included in like primary and secondary school syllabus, like simple things like, oh, how to sweep the floor, mop the floor, use a vacuum cleaner, you know, even washing the dishes. All these are like important life skills and even cooking as well. So yeah, it's something that is like very practical that I think should be taught in schools. I, I do know they actually have like, you know, classroom duties. They have like, you know, sweep the floor, whoever is supposed to sweep the floor today and all that. But I guess it's minimal lah. <laughs> <laughs> by the time by the time it's your turn you probably only did it once a month <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but I guess like cooking skills um, gardening a little bit more hands on think- stuff Another thing could be also to teach kids the importance of mental health and just being aware of their feelings, their emotions and learning how to express it. 
Oh, think, this is this is so true. Yes. In you know, in the Singapore society, I think like all of us always feel very suppressed. It's like we feel some we feel a lot of things, but we are either unable to process it or unable to express how we feel. And I think this builds up over time and it can lead to a lot of like mental health issues when the kids are older. I think this is very true, and especially for um children, our children's generation. I mean, honestly, I think they will get hit by more pressures. Um, than us, uh, even at this uh, age that they are at now, right? Um, they're getting like more than when we got during our age. So I think it's important that uh, they learn the skills on how to manage their own emotions or express themselves or yeah. understand, you know, what's going through. Teach them how to understand what's going through in their head and then like learn how to process it. Yeah, Be it whether so. they like it or they do not like it, but at least be able to acknowledge right? yeah and also like to teach the kids that there is no right or wrong emotion you know because mm. a lot of us we always feel very embarrassed if we are if we feel like angry if we feel jealous like we tend to think of it as like negative emotions so but, spot on my twin girl needs this class <laughs> <laughs> okay cool i'm sure i'm sure the minister will support this i mean okay i'll send this clip to him <laughs> It is a trending topic right now and I think it's going to be even more important as the years come. Yeah, it's so true, so true, yeah. And, and yeah, and, and for, for us parents, you know, it's not that, you know, even, even though we are more experienced, we have, we have gone through more, it doesn't necessarily mean that we know how to manage or teach them what is necessary or teach them these skills get sets as necessary because nobody taught us to... <laughs> Yeah, you're right. You're right. I think I, a, a whole syllabus about this can be created for the kids. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so good. All right. I think this is a good place to end. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for again for your me. time. Oh my gosh. Yeah, next time, so much. Next time we will um, zoom in on a more specific topic. <laughs> yes.